Second Samuel chapter 6 this evening, <clears throat> The Weight of Ministry. The easy title would have been David Brings the Ark, or The Ark Comes to Jerusalem. Now, those are obvious alternatives, but I think they miss the deeper lessons in this chapter, which is really, I think, loaded with information for all those who will want to serve God in their lives. Lessons of in ministry, lessons in ministry for, for believers on negligence. There's a lesson about incorporating the world's way into God's way, which is standard practice, unfortunately, for so many. There's, there are lessons on recovery from such a mistake. And then there are lessons on bitterness. The influence of the ark, God's visible presence among his people had an impact on everyone in this chapter, a positive influence except one. There's always one. It is a fact of life. You take four bolts out of something, one of them's going to give you a hard time. So we're going to read about Israel assembling to bring the ark to Jerusalem. Uzzah, the man who loves the Lord, a righteous man, struck dead by God. Obed-Edom prospers while David delays. And then we read of David dancing before the ark with all of his might, and Michelle despises him for it. Well, that's the coming attraction. Let's look at verse 1. Again, David gathered all the choice men of Israel, 30,000. He had previously gathered the men to uh, take Jabus, which was where Mount Moriah was located, <clears throat> and the temple would go in Jerusalem. And then he gathered the men to defeat the Philistines. This is a huge gathering of his military force. It's not all of the men. It's, a, it's a equivalent to a modern-day corps, two divisions of men, 30,000, almost a full stadium for a baseball game. And uh, these are the elite men, though. As I mentioned, not all of them. First Chronicles chapter 13, in the parallel account of these events, says, so David gathered all Israel together from Shihor, which is a river in Egypt, to as far as the entrance of Hamath, which is in Syria, to bring the ark of God from Kirjath Jerem. And so this almost a hundred mile spread of all the Jews, of certainly the tribal leaders, uh, coming to bring the ark into Jerusalem because it is that big of a deal. It was that important to all of them, and it should be, uh, therefore, beneficial for us to learn lessons that God has preserved in the story. Uh, this is spiritual war as we know it, as Christians looking at this. We say, of course, it's obvious God's going to bring 30,000 troops to bring the ark in Jerusalem because it's all about fighting evil in our lives. We don't come to the Bible just uh, for casual reading ever. When the Christian picks up the Bible, we say, Lord, help me understand or in, in my case, which is still I want to understand, but one of the dominant requests that I have is, Lord, keep it fresh, that it's not so common to me that I, I'm, I'm not benefiting from it. Well, anyway, 30,000 come, verse 2, and David arose and went with all the people who were with him from Baal Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, whose name is called by the name Yahweh of hosts, who dwells between the cherubim. Well, the historian is pouring it on, and he should be. Again, it's this big of an event. That ark of the covenant represented not only the presence of God, but the character of God, which was characterized by mercy, and so the top of the chest is known as the mercy seat. You'd have to be out of your mind not to appreciate the importance of this. They had gone 40 years with Saul. They were spiritually, they had been, they were paupers now as a kingdom goes. And David is rebuilding them. And the, I don't even know how much, uh, how aware of it they are. But where it says here about Al Judah, it transfers to the lords of Judah. It's also known as Kirjath Jerem. This goes back to 1 Samuel 7. And David, he's got strengths that Saul never used. And the Philistines will rue the day because of it. 
And here he is using these strengths that were available to Saul. Saul could have done this. He did not. David could not stand the idea of the Jebusites in possession and control of Mount Moriah. That meant everything. Where Melchizedek blessed Abraham, where Abraham offered Isaac. This was where God's people should worship from. Psalm 46, which is not said to be a psalm of David, but many of the psalms that went to the sons of Korah, for example, they were handed at some point. They, they, the influence of David came to them. And in Psalm 46, verse 4, there is a river whose stream shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. My point is, a righteous Jew will love Jerusalem because of what it means. And David was that sort of man. We, we love New Jerusalem. We can't wait for New Jerusalem to descend and we be in it. David also sought to purge from the land God's enemies. And Saul sought to purge God's anointed from the land. This is backwards, evil. David could not live without the ark of God in the city of God. It wasn't a complete picture to just to, you know, to build a church. He had to fill it, fill it with God's presence. Psalm 87, again, glorious things are spoken of you, O city of God, Selah. Uh, Saul found nothing in this for himself. There was, he was a Benjamite, and Judah wasn't, Mount Mar Moriah wasn't there, but David was all over it. So when it says David arose and went with all the people who were with him from Baal Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, you can imagine David that morning waking up lacing up his sandals, saying, this is the day. I've been waiting for this day forever. It's never happened before. He says, whose name, the historian writes, whose name is called by the name Yahweh of hosts. Now that means he is, this is the covenant name of God, Yahweh, that is direct with the Jew, linked to Moses all the way, uh, it just deep into their hearts. He is the Lord of the armies of heaven and earth. Angels and men alike. The heaviness of God's presence is indicated in this chapter. It is all over the chapter. For example, Yahweh, his name, that covenant name, is evoked 21 times in this 23-verse chapter. God is mentioned eight times. Of course, Yahweh is the mention of God. But, but and as an alternate reference to Yahweh, you say God. Eight times in 29 verses. Uh, pardon me, in 23 verses. That brings a total of 29 references to God in 23 verses. He's all over this chapter because of the hearts of the people he could work with. He could not do this in other parts of the Bible with other people in the Bible, but he could do it with this generation, and he did. Who dwells between the cherubim, as I mentioned, the presence and the character. Psalm, uh, 1 Chronicles 13, verse 6, in the same account, says, who dwells between the cherubim where his name is proclaimed because the identity and the presence of God was viewed to be. When the Shekinah went with them, the Ark of the Covenant was in front of everyone. David, he comes to the throne of a king, of a kingdom spiritually broken. That's the kingdom he takes over. And he has a threefold solution. Whether he sits down and, and writes it down or not is irrelevant. I don't think he did. But he wants to unite the land. He did that. He was very careful about that. He tried to work it out with Abner. Joab interfered. But he still united the kingdom. Then he wanted to establish the capital of the city, of the kingdom, which was Jerusalem. And establish worship on a national level, which he is doing now. And that's why he's calling everybody from the river in Egypt to Syria. He's bringing them, a big city, Hamath in, in Syria. He's bringing them here for this. And then he wants to maintain the gains, to keep it up. It's not enough just to achieve something. He also wants to maintain what he has achieved. Verse 3, so they set the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which is on the hill. And Uzzah and Ahiah, the sons of Abinadab, drove the new cart. How do you say Ohio without referencing the state of Ohio? And it's a little tricky. But uh, anyway, 
This is outside of God's commandment. Again, verse 3, the first clause. So they set the ark of God on a new cart. Where on earth did the Jews get this idea from? Well, the Philistines, they're inveterate enemies. This is what I mentioned, that this mingling of, of God's people with the world's ways and, in fact, an enemy. The Philistines, when they captured the Ark uh, of, of the Covenant and they take it back to their cities and it, the cities are plagued and they finally want to get the Ark back to the Jews, they put it on a cart. They mixed bright ideas of unbelievers with God's word and it is habit-forming, evidently, in some circles. We have to be very careful about that as individuals, that we are able to separate the spiritual from the physical, that we, I mean, the world has good ideas about a lot of things, and we can learn a lot of things from people that are not saved as people go. But when it comes to worshiping God, we have the word of God for that. And God does not appreciate our mingling in these bad ideas. It's called leaven. And a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Paul says it this way. Don't you know? No, you're not. A little leaven, just a pinch, I mess up the whole thing. The ratio is irrelevant. Because in the end, that little bit will turn it to 100% corruption. Romans 12, he says it this way, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Well, the Jews knew what the perfect will of God when it came to this. And so in introducing this chapter, I mentioned that we're coming across this blunder, this bad idea, this disobedient act. And these people love the Lord. We're not taking any of that from them. These are solid believers as far as we know. Every indication is that way. We can want God's presence so much that we set about achieving it with things that are forbidden. We get in the flesh. That's what we would say. You're in the flesh now. You're not trusting God. You're not following God. You're trying to serve God, and it happens very quickly for all of us. All of us are susceptible to this. Anointed men... Not angels, not animals, are to convey the presence of God to men. I didn't say the word, I said the presence of God. Exodus 25, 14. You shall put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark, that the ark may be carried by them. The them are God's servants, the Levites in this case, and not just any Levite. Not just anyone could just do whatever they wanted and say, well, I'm a believer. Christians, have to, they, many of, the, of us are afraid of this discipline that belongs to our, our faith. There are just some things you cannot do just because you're a Christian. There is weight to ministry. There are things that we must bear on our shoulders. There is labor, and th this is the picture of bearing the ark on the poles, carrying it. And what a picture that would be. If you were in the wilderness with the Jews and they were marching along tribe by tribe, and as the tribe bend and would bend and turn, you'd, if you were in the rear, you could get a look from a distance of the ark leading everybody. Even though it was from a distance, you, could, you knew what this meant if you were a righteous Jew. Some of them were just carnal as could be and really couldn't care. It says here in verse 3, and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. It is a, probably a, a little over 80 years that ark had been sitting there since the Philistines captured it and it was returned. That's where it, they, they sat the ark and that's where it stayed until David goes and gets it. But it doesn't make a direct trip to, to Jerusalem because there's always a fly in the ointment. Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, they are all Levites, drove the new cart. Well, just because they were authorized by God to transport the ark does not mean they were authorized to do it any good way they wanted to. No matter what their good intentions were, 
another lesson coming out for us. They drove the new cart. This is ministry man's way. It may seem easier, but catastrophe is lurking. And we, as with David, want to bring the presence of God to where we worship. And so he brings again his armies, his armies to do this. He gets all Israel, as verse, tell, verse 15 will tell us, as, as, all, as many, you know, all of the big shots, the decision makers of the lands. I don't mean big shots in a negative way at all in, in this case. But to automate ministry, to escape the labor under the guidelines of the scripture, to get away from bearing the weight is wrong. And we have to watch out for it. It's so easy to do because sometimes it makes sense. Yeah, that's just a better way. And there's nothing in the scripture that prohibits that. But there's other times when you can't do that. You have to, it, regardless of how difficult it is, it's for you to do it this way. The law kept a distance between God and man, which is spoken to us by the fact they had to use poles and they couldn't just touch the ark. And if they touched the ark and they were not a priest, they'd be struck dead. The law kept that distance. Serving God as commanded by God versus serving God in negligence. And they're, they're being negligent right now. Now, this is not, again, to say that we are to, you know, self-flogging. We have to do it the hard way. No, we have to do it the biblical way, even if that is the hard way. But if the Bible allows it to be the easier way, then I'm going to do it the easy way in that, that case. But to put the ark on a cart so I don't have to carry it so we can get to the destination is what we're talking about. Now, modifications to these things must come from God, and sometimes they do. They come from God to men, and there's going to be a modification to this particular commandment. Second Chronicles chapter 35, this is after Solomon, or in the building of the temple, what happens to the ark? Well, the ark is going, in, going to go to the most holy of holy places in the temple, and the poles will remain in it, but it will not be carried anymore because there's been a modification. There's other duties that they will have to maintain. They won't be like, whew, we don't have to carry that anymore. Well, they had, they had you know, 10 uh, uh, carts and 10 this and the lampstands. They had a lot of work to do and still. Anyway, Second Chronicles 35, 3, then he, that is King Josiah, uh, this is so it's after Solomon, said to the Levites who taught all Israel who were, who were holy to Yahweh, put the holy ark in the house of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, that he built. It shall no longer be a burden on your shoulders. Now serve Yahweh your God and his people Israel. Now, of course, that's in Solomon's story too, but years later, Josiah, the last righteous king of Judah, comes along, and he's restoring worship to Judah. And I, I wanted to take that particular segment because he, the words are the, uh, the most fitting for our discussion. It shall no longer be a burden on your shoulders. Now serve Yahweh your God and his people Israel. But they were not burden free. They still had other things to do. And that was uphold righteousness and maintain the temple. Verse 4, and they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill accompanying the ark of God. And Ohio went before the ark. Ark. Uh, this is zeal without knowledge. Remember Paul to the Romans talked about his beloved people. He said they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Yeah, they want, they want, oh, I love God, I love God, but, but not according to God's word. And you, that, if you're going to pay the price for that kind of false worship, now, this is not as intense, remembering that these people love the Lord, but they're negligent nonetheless, and the lessons for us because we love the Lord, and we can be negligent in our service, if not careful. Verse 5, Then David and all the house of Israel played music before Yahweh on all kinds of instruments, of fir wood, on harps, on stringed instruments, on tambourines, on sistrums, and cymbals. Uh, they did uh, this devotion, this playing of music and worshiping in song does not make right the wrong that they are doing and it's not going to stop the judgment that is about to strike. 
no matter how devoted they were and how into their worship, you know, you see people, they sometimes in church, you know, they can be so worshiping, so disobedient in their life and not even receptive to correction. That's false worship. And you can be worse sincere and struggling with things, but uh, you, you, the struggle is on to obey God. Sincerity of feelings do not justify disobedience ever. God's not touched by disobedience. It doesn't move him the way we might think it does. That doesn't mean he's is, you know, brutal against us when we fail, but it does mean that we cannot expect God to condone uh, sin or disobedience or the breaking of his word. The uh, sistrums were not female drums. They were sort of like maracas uh, without but they were open. You can look it up. Uh, verse 6, not an impressive instrument. They just, somebody just couldn't, had no musical skill, and they wanted to get him in the band, so they gave them this one. Anyway, you know, I can't tell him he can't sing. We've got to give him something. Verse 6, and when they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God, and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. It was the natural thing to do. It just wasn't the spiritual thing to do. And it cost everyone. So the ark is on the cart where it doesn't belong. The oxen stumble. It shifts, the load shifts, it was like maybe it's going to slide off. God did not need Uzzah to do this. He needed Uzzah to be part of not putting the ark where it did not belong. Verse 7, Then the anger of Yahweh was aroused against Uzzah, and God struck him there for his error, and he died by the ark of God. Well, this is horrific. It's a tragedy. Uh, you know, it's sort of, it's worse than just a, a job site death. This is spiritual. The anointed king, the anointed prophets, the anointed priests and Levites and the people of God, all of them had good intentions, but still, look what happened. Their intentions were wrong. I mean, you can, have, you can be obedient in good intentions and things still go <clears throat> the wrong way. But to be wrong at the same time. So good intentions, one of the lessons from this, <clears throat> the weight in ministry is intentions outside of God's word can be fatal. There are people that have gone to the mission field that should not have gone to the mission field, and they either have been died there or caused others to die there, or it just uh, it ends in disaster. The word reverence comes to mind. When we do things in God's name, is there that reverence? Or are we self-willed, just doing it because it's a good idea and it feels good to us? Which is a hard sermon or a hard uh, study. If you're an emotionally driven Christian, and you just do everything by your feelings. You're probably a pain in the neck to other people, too. Incidentally, if, you, if you're doing that, uh, you know, the feelings are all over this chapter, but they need to be in line. They need to be under the authority of God and the host. Paul said the prophet is not made subject to the gift. You can't just say, well, I've got the gift and I have lost control. Well, the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. So maybe it's another spirit that uh, you're under in that case. You know, whole churches, that's how they run. They have people dressed like nurses so you can, you can pass out safely. And... Well, anyway, some don't allow their results to be examined because they hide behind good intention. But I meant well, so you can't say anything. I'm a sacred cow now. You can't touch what I, the mess I just created you know, maybe if somebody's having marital problems and you want to stick your nose where it doesn't belong and God is certainly not in your help and you just make things worse. And what I meant well, well, you better have a little bit more care in that. I hope this scares all of us together enough to be a, maintain reverence. We don't handle the presence of God. The presence of God is supposed to handle us. What about this man, Uzzah, or that, what about him? Well, I, every indication he was a righteous man. We have no reason to doubt that we'll see him in heaven just because he broke a commandment here. Others have done far worse. 
and we'll be in heaven, King David 1. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. God always does right. If loser's not in heaven, it won't be because of this act. It would be because of his unbelief in Yahweh. But he was a believer. And what if God allowed this negligence to go unaddressed on such a vital occasion as this, at this delicate time in the history of the Jews, what if God just ignored this? And they had a hard enough time uh, keeping the idols out of the land. They didn't need any help in their disobedience. And so God is just very intolerant of this. The kings were not to violate the priesthood. The priests were not to violate the priesthood. And that's true for us. We are a royal priesthood. That's a combination of, of, um, of the king and the priest together. And yet we're not permitted as Christians to violate Christianity and kind of shrug it off. King Saul learned that. Uzziah is, has learned that. King Saul, Uzziah the Levite, and then King Uzziah, one of the best kings in, in, in Judah of, of all of Israel's history. 52 years he reigned as king. Is the one that Isaiah lamented when he had this vision of God. In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. And, and so this Uzziah, he got too big for his britches. He decides he's going to go to the temple and offer incense on the golden altar, altar, which is prohibited. And God smote him with leprosy. But before God smote him, those priests lined up. They were ready to die, keeping him out of the holy place. It says here, and he died there by the ark of God. Clearly, the presence of God was present. And saying this, I told you, you were warned. Numbers chapter 4, verse 14. And when Aaron and his sons had finished covering the sanctuary and all the furnishings of the sanctuary, when the camp is set to go, then the sons of Kohath shall come and carry them and they shall not touch any holy thing lest they die. Well, he touched the holy thing and he died just like God warned. And in that little section, we have all of these rules. Oh, you're so uptight. You've got so many. Why do you think they exist? Why, <laughs> well, we just we had nothing to do over a cheeseburger and came up with rules. They come up for a reason. And once you get into the rhythm of them, they're very beneficial. At least I have found it that way it's amazing how many people want to name their kids after old testament heroes they just don't want to have the order that belonged to those heroes and the times they lived in that came from god such as there in numbers 4 15 uh, we should not be afraid of the things that keep our flesh in line and that was one for the jews this was not too high of a price to pay to lose one man in front of the nation to spiritually stabilize the nation. It was a very good thing. God has a history of being protective of infant events and critical moments that are related to him. One of the first one is Nadab and Abihu, the, the two eldest sons of Aaron, Israel's first high priest, the brother of Moses. They decided that they could just take anything into the worship, act of worship, and they took strange fire, and God struck them dead on the spot. It's a very ugly scene, but it was necessary. And then Aaron was challenged by Korah, who was a Levite and felt that Moses took too much authority on him. So you and your brother, you, you just who do you think you are? You think you're the only preachers and pastors of God's people? That's pretty much what happened. Of course, the ground swallowed him up. God got involved. Moses was so gentle with this guy. I, I would have I been gentle in the CPR part. <laughs> Peter, when Ananias and Sapphira lied in front of everybody to the church, what happened to them? Both of them were smitten dead. And Paul versus Elimus, Paul smote him blind for a while. So my, my point is God is very protective of infant causes in his name at critical moments, and this is one of them. Paul writes to the Corinthians in the second letter. He says, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Reverence is part of our faith. There's nothing wrong with 
being solemn at times. And as much as grace and freedom that we have, we're not supposed to be sloppy and reckless with the kindness and goodness of God. Verse 8, And David became angry because of Yahweh's outbreak against Uzzah, and he called the name of the place Perez Uzzah to this day. Again, I don't think they're very creative in renaming these places. <laughs> just, uh, anyway, uh, before David was angry, God was angry. God was the one that was wrong. He's the victim here. His word was just, they neglected it. And they had no reason to neglect it. Uh, they, they likely did everything else right. They covered the ark, the priests, not the Levites. Then the priests come with the, you know, lift the poles up and put it onto the cart. That's where everything started going wrong. And the Bible does not cover up the blunder of the priest and the blunder of the king, and it doesn't cover up the reaction of the king. David was hot with anger. What? But it doesn't say who he's angry with. Is he angry at God? I would go that way for me personally because that's a flaw of my character. That's the only flaw I have, though. <laughs> and lying is another one. <laughs> that is kind of funny. Anyhow, uh, I don't think David was angry at God. I think he was just angry at everything that went wrong. Himself, the priest, Uzzah, just that kind of, you know, man, where, why? Why? And the reason why, now some commentators think he's angry with God and he collects himself. I, I, and here's why I don't think so, because he never loses the passion to get that ark to Jerusalem. In fact, he begins to somewhat fret. Like, How am I going to do this now? And to me, that tells me uh, he had his chance to voice his frustration. And he does not. In fact, when he gets, as the ark gets to Jerusalem, he writes a psalm about it, and it never comes up. Uh, he just writes, you know, touch not God's anointed, you know. And it's just, it's, so anyway, verse 9 now, David was afraid of Yahweh that day, and he said, how can the ark of Yahweh come to me? You see, that day, he's like, he's, they're re talking about reverence and the weight of ministry. This is ministry. What is ministry? Ministry is serving God, and usually includes serving people, and usually includes being inconvenienced at some point. God needs servants that have broad shoulders and iron jaws versus narrow shoulders and glass jaws. You know, glass jaws in boxing, you know, the guy hits you in the jaw one time and you just shatter like glass and that's the end of the fight. Uh, it's so many Christians, are just we can be this way. You know, we get hit by something that hurts us and we just shatter. And everything is gone. All the work, everything is wiped away. The devil wins again. Take the hit. Take the pain. Ministry is weight. Maybe you serve in the children's ministry, and some parent makes some little snide remark, and you want to just, you know, do a little kung fu on them. But you can't because you don't know kung fu. So <laughs> uh, you just take it. You leave it with God. And it, will, it won't always go away right away. Sometimes it will stay for a long time for God to extract whatever lessons he's wanted. Just take it. Uh, what's the alternative? Uh, musical churches, that's the alternative. When the band stops playing, everybody be seated somewhere else. Uh, all right. Well, if these things don't get said, how will they ever get addressed as inconvenient as they are? Uh, verse 9, David was afraid of Yahweh that day. We never read of Saul being afraid of Yahweh where we read of Saul being afraid of everything else, and we never read of David being afraid of men. In fact, when David's old, he's going to be on the battlefield, and he almost gets killed, and his men come and save him. and say, you can't come here. You can't fight anymore, David. I mean, this, you, and we know you've got this courage, but you, know, those, you don't have the moves anymore. The mechanics aren't working like they used to. Leviticus 10, verse 3, And Moses said to Aaron, this is what Yahweh spoke, saying, By those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy, and before all the people, I must be glorified. And God has never walked back from that verse. Nowhere in our New Testament does God say, Okay, we have graduated from that. When Jesus said, Think not that I've come to destroy the law, law but to perfect it. 
He meant every word of that, not a jot or a tittle. And we have it before us to, uh, to, to honor and to serve and to bear the weight of the presence of God. Because you put that Ark of the Covenant, which was made of mostly wood except the, that, the, the lid, um, it would be light at first, but it would get heavy. Anything you bear over any length of period of time gets heavy. Um, how can the ark of Yahweh come to me? So David loses Uzzah, but he does not lose the objective. He still, uh, that ark still got to get to Jerusalem. Uh, we understand that in the world. Uh, in the job sites, you know, people get killed. You still got to, the building still got to go up. Everybody's back to work the next day. Verse, you know, it's kind of morbid. Verse 10, so David would not move the ark of Yahweh with him into the city of David, but David took it aside into the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. He suspends all operations because he doesn't know what to do. And I don't think anybody else touched the ark. <laughs> Moving it from the cart to the, to the house. Uh, it was no trivial matter to the man with the shepherd's heart, King David. This was a serious matter. Obed-Edom, he is a Levite too. Uh, we... First Chronicles 15, we would, I'm not going to read it now, but he later becomes one of the doorkeepers in the temple of God, um, which is like an usher in the house of God. As David said, I'd rather be a servant, a doorkeeper in the house of God than, you know, I don't, a king anywhere else or anywhere else. Anyway, the, he being a Gittite means he's from Gath, but not Gath of the Philistines. Uh, there were two Gaths, Gath Rimon, which was for the Levites, and then there was Hefler, which was another one of the Jewish cities. He was from Rimon, which, uh, which is um, a count. He's, he's not a Philistine. Hopefully, we work God's work, God's way, and deal with, uh, avoid the consequences and, and deal with the hardship, the weight of, of ministry. So inside David's heart, and this a traumatic experience, what is in his heart? Not his head, what is driving him? Well, leading him is probably a, a more accurate description. Exodus 25, verse 21, because it just moves us. And when we read this verse as a Christian, you say to you, ask yourself, does this have any weight to you? Does it matter to you? God speaking to Moses for the people, you shall... Put the mercy seat on top of the ark. And in the ark you shall put the testimony that I will give you, the tablets with the commandments. And there I will meet with you, and I will speak with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which are on the ark of the testimony, about everything which I will give you in commandment to the children of Israel. So God is saying to Moses, I'm going to speak with you from the Ark of the Covenant. So David is like, yeah, I want this. I'm the king of Israel. I love the Lord. I want his presence here. I want us to be able to hear from God. This is what is moving him. And every believer knows how difficult it is to keep serving when you need to hear from God and you're not hearing from God. And you have to just comply with your last order as unpleasant as it may be. I need more information. I need confirmation. I need to know you're still with me. And nothing. You get silence. What do you walk by then? Faith. And that is something that no one else is supposed to pull off like we do. Verse 11, the ark of Yahweh remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months. And Yahweh blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. And all the prosperity teachers went out and bought arks. I want the blessing. I don't care what God wants. I want the blessing. If I got to love you to get the blessing, I'll love you. But I really hate you. But if you get me there, I want that car so badly. If I just can rub the Bible the right way, poof, for a racket. The Bunko Squad needs to come visit them. Anyway, anyway. and vice, and homicide, and all. <laughs> Verse 12. Now it was told David, saying, Yahweh has blessed the house of Obed-Edom, and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. So David went and bought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom, the city of David, 
with gladness. <laughs> He's calm. David said, what? <laughs> That's why I've been trying to bring it to Jerusalem. And he's getting the black. Uh-uh. <laughs> I don't, it certainly wasn't, as I'm portraying it, a little caricature to go with it. But it is true. Uh, I know it's true for me. When in, in early days, you know, I'm not going to do this. And God said, well, then I'll get somebody else. Oh, no, you won't. No, no. I, I'm not built that way. This is righteous pride. You call me to do this, I'll do it. Just don't get somebody else. <laughs> a little possessiveness there that God kind of uses in his favor. And I think some of that's happening there. Someone observed that Obed was doing pretty good. Hey, that's a new car. Where'd you get that? It's just money showed up. And they went, hey, David, look what Obed's driving. It's better than yours. Second Chronicles 5 Nothing was in the ark except two tablets which Moses put there. So by this time, the rod of Aaron and the pot of manna had been maybe in the days of the judges. Anyway, David knew that the blessings were where the Lord dwells. And we do too. It's just that they're not material based. They can be, but they're not. He's not obligated to do this. As Paul said, but for these chains, I wish you were just like me. And they said, yeah, right. Um, they weren't giving that life stuff lifestyle up a reminder that God is gracious encouraging David to resume his quest to bring the ark to Jerusalem by blessing Obed-Edom it, and it's just another move of God who would have thought you would David was probably thinking you know the prophet Nathan will come to me and say okay David it's time or the priest was hey I consulted the room and and God said yes bring the ark but it was just nothing it was just a, what do we do and God, they just have a, this object lesson before them in that Obed is blessed right in front of their eyes. So now they're going to correct the error by resuming the quest. David starts with, whose fault was it? At some point, he's got to get to the bottom. Of the, whose fault was Uzzah's death? And the first people guilty were the priest and the Levites. They were the keepers of the law concerning the tabernacle before anyone else. They were line one. So David points the finger with gentleness, though. He doesn't clobber them. First Chronicles chapter 15, verse 13, he says this, For because of you, well, we, we go back, For because you did not do it the first time, Yahweh our God broke out against us, because we did not consult him about the proper order. So the priests and the Levites sanctified themselves to bring up the ark of Yahweh, God of Israel, and the children of the Levites bore the ark of God on their shoulders in its poles, and as Moses had commanded according to the word of Yahweh. Recovery. Instead of just, you know, abandoning things and giving up, but he, he includes himself. Me too. I was wrong also. That's what he says. Because God broke out against us. Because we did not consult him about the proper order. And it's amazing. You see people come to the church and they hymn and hawk because they can't bring water into the sanctuary. Well, you, you, you know, could you not watch with me one hour? Well, I have a medical condition. Well, maybe you should be in a hospital. I don't know. I'm sure there are serious ones. You can't adjust for everybody. Uh, what if, you know, you, you know, I like to use the bubble boy example. Remember, bubble boy had to stay away from germs. Well, what if he wanted to come to church? What are we supposed to do, take out a loan and renovate, uh, you know, and get a bubble for him? No, you just, some things you just can't do. And you expect people to understand. But they can be vicious, those people that call themselves Christians. Sometimes they can be worse than unbelievers. So, uh, not me. <laughs> uh, I'm always, I mean... Um, that's one of the beauties about driving with smoked windows. Hey, that's Pastor Rick. <laughs> no, this is not true. I mean, it's true, but it's wrong, and I don't do with that. But I mean, it's all right. Let's go on. That's my break, my mental break for this, this evening. I don't know if other pastors need mental breaks because I don't listen to them. <laughs> Because the whole time I'm listening to them, I'm saying they should be listening to me because I'm so humble. Anyhow, uh, 
this graciousness that David approaches this with in correcting the error and resuming the mission. It, it, the ark has got to get to Jerusalem, and uh, he learned the lesson that the death of Uzzah was supposed to teach, that you just don't go doing these things before me and break, break my law and then want to come worship me. <laughs> you know, that was the whole thing. Look, we're worshiping God the wrong way, and he should be good with this. Uh, this time they would be prepared. We are not automatically fit for service simply because we're believers. And a lot of Christians think that. We think that simply, some, some, some won't serve because they're afraid they won't, they're going to mess up. And that's, that's good in that, but it can't stay there. They've got to break out of that and get their boots on the ground and do it like everybody else. And if you see, hey, if, if that guy can serve, I can serve. Just pick out somebody who you think is a slob serving and say, well, if they can serve. I'm kidding, and <laughs> you shouldn't be doing anything like that. But you shouldn't be too afraid to where you can't move. So uh, Uzzah was not carefree, but he was wrong. Verse 13, and so it was when those bearing the ark of Yahweh had gone six paces that he sacrificed oxen and fatted sheep. I mean, you know they were ready for this. He didn't just, oh, hey, there's six oxen. Uh, they, they brought this, this and he calls the nation again together and, and they're going to now bring the ark uh, from Obed-Edom's house and they go six steps and everything stops and they sacrifice to the Lord. That's going to take a lot of time during the, of the day. It's going to eat up a lot of the time. You've got to bleed the animal, butcher the animal, have the fires right and where the ark of the Lord was, that's where they could make the sacrifices. Um, here are men made in the image of God, marred by sin, and still in ministry. And the weight of ministry has served them well. He had gone to six paces. Of course, if you, the number six is the number of man in biblical typology. Seven, the number of completion, like the Sabbath day and the seventh. Eight, the number of new beginnings. Of the week starts uh, then. The resurrection was on a Sunday. Uh, if, if that's biblical uh, numerology, and it, you can't ignore it. It's not 100%, but when it is uh, clear, there's the, the context makes it's no mistake to it. And so here they were, uh, uh, the, and the message behind this six steps is the righteous can't go far without communion. The righteous cannot move forward in serving God without stopping to worship God along the way. The church at Ephesus began to march with the ark without God. And so he says, you left your first love. Uh, he says that he sacrificed oxen and fatted sheep. Well, in, from the Christian perspective, looking at Christian history, much of it's shameful, but a lot of it has blood on it, uh, the blood of the martyrs. Uh, it has a lot of righteousness also. And the righteous are able to sort that out, and the unbeliever likes to, uh, of course, cherry pick only the negative. Uh, the blood is the life of the animal. Uh, verse 14, then David danced before the Lord or Yahweh with all his might, and David was wearing a linen ephod. Now it's just ramped up. He's free. He's free. This is, nobody's getting struck dead now. And it, uh, they, after the, the sacrifice comes this whirling and dance. That's what he's doing. He's not just, you know, doing tap dancing. He is whirling around and... Uh, uh, how else can you dance with all your might? You're just stomping after a while. Maybe flamenco dancing is a lot, but not as much as whirling. And if today, if you go to the Temple Mountain, there's a bar mitzvah there, and they've hired the professional singers and dancers, and you can see them whirling around. But it's not a moshing pit. You're not clumsily banging into people because I'm worshiping. <laughs> you, you know, when you, we worship, you know, and you raise, raise your hands up. We don't want to stick them in the face of the guy next to you. That's kind of rude. Uh, you, and anyway... Um, this is an orderly abandonment, and it's not in the assembly. It's not going to the synagogue for the reading of the word and breaks out into dance. We have booby traps set in place for that kind of behavior, and uh, just hoping someday somebody does it so we can show you. <laughs> not true. Uh, there's nothing wrong with, with uh, worshiping with all your might like this. Just got to be in the right forum. And here, the assembly and the teaching of the word is not the place. First Chronicles 29, speaking about David and his might. He also gave to God with all of his might. 
Now for the house of my God, I have prepared with all my might. You shall love the Lord your God, your, all your heart, soul, mind, strength. And he lived it out. It says David was wearing a linen ephod, a vest that the priest wore. And he's wearing one. He's not wearing the ephod uh, of, the, of the, the breastplate, just the vest. And he's wearing it to honor the priest and submitted as king to not overthrowing the priesthood in front of everybody. And he is declaring that there is no king in the worship of God. It's just worship. He's exchanging the royal robe for uh, the robe of the minister. And it's gonna, there's going to be weight from this too coming from uh, his, his wife, Michelle. We'll be coming to that in a moment. And so... 1 Chronicles 29, 3, Moreover, because I have set my affection on the house of my God, I have given to the house of my God over and above all that I have prepared for the holy house, my own special treasure of gold and silver. It cost him. I mean, how come we can't learn these lessons from this man? He said, David, at the end of his life, saying, I put everything I've got. Is such dedication from the man that is whirling before the Ark of the Covenant, that's making it happen. Where was Saul to do this? Judging everybody else. Uh, verse 15, So David and all the house of Israel brought up the Ark of Yahweh with shouting and with the sound of trumpets. They were just wild with worship. Not Well, not wild, you know. Again, you can take the trumpet, blowing it so hard, you're clumping the guy next to you. It's not the picture at all, but it is a, a, a very energetic event and we can see them the priests with the poles on their shoulders bearing the ark and not a wagon with oxen but men of God according to God and uh, Joseph Parker he pastored in London over a hundred years ago he says the instruments were a thousand in number but the tune was one and that is the point now he's using probably hyperbole, not likely there were a thousand musicians there, but he's saying there were a lot of them. But they were in tune, and that is the beauty of it. First Chronicles 13, verse 8, Then David and all Israel played music before God with all their might. And they were just joining in in the singing. You can't, everybody comes with a banjo. That would be a concophony, not a symphony. Verse 16 now the ark of Yahweh came into the city of David as the ark of the covenant of, of the Lord came into the city of David. Michelle, Saul's daughter, looked through the window and saw King David leaping and whirling before Yahweh and she despised him in her heart. This went deep. It wasn't, she, she didn't just say, nah. she, this was hatred here. Once she risked her life for David, once she loved him, but it was a carnal love. It was not a deep love. It was the love that I'll love you long as things are going my way. And at that time in her life, she chose her righteous husband over her unrighteous father, but Saul out-influenced David, and she let it happen. Here is David in full-blown worship, and his own wife meets him in full-blown disdain and disgust for his uncouth behavior before a dignified Michelle. This is, she's a snob. Kings don't behave that way. You always have to maintain the royal dignity. And, and he's like, I'm worshiping. <laughs> this, I am with all my might. Uh, her father... Saul ruined everything. He ruined everything he came near. We, we covered Saul. And we don't want to forget some of the things he, that he did that were just horrific. She was maneuvered from being married to David by her father, King Saul, into an unlawful marriage, which David then stripped them of. And he had to do that. They had no right to be married. There were big problems in that society, uh, in, in any society. But uh, he, he had to do it. And they were wrong. You say, well, he was on the run from Saul. Well, other women came to him. What was, where was his wife? Why didn't Michelle come to him if she was all that? 
because she's playing king's court. And when he, David, returns, the victor, her father's dead, her brothers are dead, uh, and now she's, her, the husband that seems to have loved her, Pat Tael, uh, he also seems to have been, uh, knowing what we know of Michelle, he was probably just a, uh, a honeydew, you know, honeydew this, honeydew that, and, and not a stand-up guy. And he, uh, but uh, anyway, um, now she's back, and now she has to compete with six other wives, at least, and more will come, and concubines, and their children, and she doesn't have any children. Now she's bitter at God, at David, at Judah, and who knows who else. And she's going to let everybody know it. Now, Hebrews, don't take this verse lightly. Hebrews 12, looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. He's saying become unretrievable. They get so polluted, you can't fix them because they're bitter. They have such hatred. They've been violated, and they are not going to forgive. They're not going to build on it. She, that's her. You can, you can write her name there in Hebrews 12, 15. It's not easy to feel sorry for her because she sowed these seeds, and she doesn't back down from doing it. She's like her father now. She, everything she touches is ruined. Yeah, I mean, there are men in the Bible just, just as messed up, Nabal. I mean, it just creeps all over the Scripture, male and female alike, equally. So, uh, again, she could have done like Abigail and left the comforts of her home and joined David, but there was no love there. Verse 17, so they brought the ark of Yahweh and set it up in its place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had erected for it. Then David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings to Yahweh. And here we're told uh, in Chronicles uh, that he wrote Psalm 105. Well, at least the first part, the first 15 so verses of Psalm 105 come from this moment. He was ready. So he had been writing songs while, he, while the ark was in Obed's house, and he delivers it. And he's just, uh, you know, such a man filled with God. First Chronicles 16, 7. On that day, David first delivered this psalm into the hand of Asaph, the, his brethren, to thank Yahweh. He's just a magnificent character. It's going to hurt when he starts to stumble, but uh, this is reality. This is life in a cursed world. He recovers from that too, though. And in the end, Satan loses, David wins. Verse 18, and, David had finished, and when David had finished offering, burnt offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of Yahweh of hosts, then he distributed among the, all the people, verse 19, among the whole multitude of Israel, both the women and the men, to everyone, a loaf of bread, a piece of meat, and a cake of raisins. So all the people departed, everyone to his own house. Well, the sacrifice, the peace offerings, you, you shared in the meal. You'd make your offering, God would take the fat and the organs, and you would get uh, the, uh, the piano and the meat. And you would, you know, dine there with the Lord in communion. And this is what they're doing. And he gives them, you know, he gives them the staple diet, you know, the grain, the meat, and sweets, which in those days was a big treat. This was well planned. It paid off. He shared the wealth of the nation with the people of the nation. Saul would never have done such a thing. Verse 20, then David returned to bless his household, and Michelle, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, how glorious was the king of Israel today. Hiss, 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 covering himself today in the eyes, uh, uncovering himself today in the eyes of the maids of his servants. Again, hiss, hiss, hiss. And one of, <laughs> and one of the base fellows shamelessly, as one of the base fellows, shamelessly covers himself. And there's the hissing yet again. You can hear it between clauses. After each comma, she's, ah, she's angry. She couldn't wait. We covered this a little already. And Michelle, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet him. She's not waiting for him to come in the house. She's coming out. It says David returned to bless his household. He's coming to bless his home. And she comes out of the home and attacks. That plan did not go well. He'd come to bless, and she provoked him to curse. And that's not as we, you know, to, to uh, pass a judgment on her is what he does. 
Michelle, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, um, he is married to a woman who just resisted God with all her might. He worshiped with all of his might. She resisted. She says, how glorious was the king of Israel today, uncovering himself today in the eyes of the maids of his servants. This is facetious. He's, uh, it's an exaggeration, of course. He wasn't nude. She's sarcastically lashing out. She can't wait to lash out. People can see this. She's out in public. She's not waiting for him to come in the house. What can be said about a struggling marriage where this is excused, where a husband or a wife is abusing the other one with such language? What do you say about that? They're not gonna, it's, 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 a, it's gonna be a, a bad road to travel. David uh, did not think about the maidens while he was worshiping as she accuses him. God was in his eyes. He didn't care what anybody thought except God. And she made a mockery of his worship, a worship that was so critical to not only David and the people that when they blundered in this worship, it cost a man his life. And here's this king abandoned to God, and he doesn't need her to tell him how to worship his Lord. Not only did she not care for worship, she did not want others to care for it either. She would rather David be like her father. And God was in none of his thoughts. And this argument that they're having over worship was more than the marriage could bear. Because, well, we'll get to his reply. And she says here in verse 20, we're almost out of time. As one of the base fellows shamelessly uncovers himself, it's derogatory. David had the attire of the priest. He had the vest of the priest, and she's saying, you're shamelessly covered. I mean, she's all messed up in her head, just the, the product of her psycho father, because she wanted it to be that way. This is irreconcilable. Anyway, verse 21, so David said to Michelle, it was before Yahweh who chose me instead of your father and all his house to appoint me ruler over the people of Yahweh over Israel. Therefore, I will play music to the Lord. So David said, I could have danced all night. <laughs> I could have danced all night. Uh, anyway, for those of you who know it, we can enjoy it. Uh, uh, what, he's not going to conform to what people think he should do as a worshiper, as king, so long as it's not against God. Tozer says this, he says, David was God intoxicated, a God intoxicated man to the outrage of the cold-hearted Michelle. And that is true. Verse 22, and I will be even more undignified than this. <laughs> and he And will be humble in my own sight. But as for the maidens whom you have spoken by them, I will be held in honor. This did not go well for her. I don't have time to get all the comments in, but uh, he is saying, you don't, you don't tell me how to serve God. He stands up to her. There's a lot of men that won't stand up to their wives. And therefore, they can't stand up to anybody else when it comes to preaching Christ. And then there are a lot of wives that don't submit to a godly husband and uh, cause conflict there also. Uh, men do their dirt, too. So, ladies, you know I'm not singling you out, but we're talking about Michelle here. And she is doing everything wrong. Uh, she could have done this to Pal Tayal, their other husband. She ain't doing this to David. Uh, David says, I, I, I run my house and if, no matter what. And that's that. So she refuses the blessings of seek you first the kingdom of God and these things will be added to you. All things will be given to you. She refuses that blessing even though it doesn't come as we know it. Well, we went over time, so uh, I'll need an escort so the children's workers don't <laughs> come after me. Let's pray. Our Father, uh, just a chapter loaded with lessons for us. May we ponder them and do something with it. May you get us all home safely tonight, we ask you in Jesus' name. Amen.